Hello, Mark. Ready for part six? <laughs> I, I think so. I hope so. I hope we both are because we're doing it. So let's hope. I wonder what, what the over under is on how many we're going to do. It looks like it might take 12 to get all the way through. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we don't we don't have the good fans that uh, that uh, Pastor Paul has. So that's I, true. I hope there's an over under on our stuff here, but that's true. Be. Yeah, maybe we can do it in eight. I don't know. So so we're still working on the Jordan Peterson John Verveke conversation. That's an, almost a psychedelic conversation, which I'm calling the psychedelic conversation because that's the way it seemed to me. And uh, you had an idea today that the section we're going to cover, which we're going to try to cover 50 minutes, maybe 55, that there's only three big themes in that 55 minutes. And um, what are they? And then we'll try and look at some clips. Yeah. So what I'm seeing is, you know, Jordan's got three big questions in this section, at least. Right. There's his ever present question that people are couching as a culture war question, which I think is fundamentally incorrect, but uh, of, you know, what is his thesis about the postmodern neo Marxist claim that power is the primary driver of human behavior or something like that? You know, is that a valid claim? So he's still asking that question. He asked it about three times in this 50 or so minute section. Um, the, the other, the other thing that, that he's, uh, trying to tie into that, roughly speaking, is, you know, what is consciousness and how does it work, like within an evolutionary sort of a framework, right, because he's still talking the evolutionary framework, and then he's trying to tie all that back to the transcendent or God, right, he, so he's, he's, he's tying all that back, not just to God, but to religion per se, so how do those th three things relate, and he's, you can see him in this section, and it bounces a lot between those three things, three frames, if you will, those three ways of, of, of thinking. Uh, he, you can see him trying to sort of wrestle with a hone in on or stalk the beast of wisdom here that, that tells him the answer to how all those three things are, at, are attached together if, if they are, right? Because he, he's, not, he's not sure. And that's what John is for in some sense is to help him figure that out. Because again, I think John is uniquely qualified to answer questions in all three of those domains for him. Right. So I, I think that's what, what they're on about specifically in this section pretty tightly, too. I mean, there's some joking. There's a lot better camaraderie in this section. He does another T-shirt joke maybe twice. I think actually it, it's quite it's quite uh, rich and full of uh, interesting compliments and, and things like that between the two colleagues. So it's a beautiful, beautiful section. Yeah. And there's interrupting going on on both sides. <laughs> As always. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I thought we might start with a clip that's actually at a right around. So at the beginning, they kind of go through this thing about John is explaining to Jordan that the cog side has moved on from mind as computation over to mind as an embodied auto poetic dynamical system. Well, I got curious about that. What is an auto poetic dynamical system? So I looked up autopoesis. In biological systems, it can be viewed as a network of constraints that work to maintain themselves. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting because of my whole issue with constraints and boundaries and so forth. Um, it's also this idea that an autopoetic system is a system that's contained within itself and has the capacity to regenerate and, and continue like a cell would be an autopoetic system. Right. Right. And and John is saying that now they're starting to think about mind as being an embodied autopoetic system. So that's a shift, apparently. Prior to that, apparently they were looking at it much more from a strictly materialist frame that um, mind is just computation, just bits, right. ones and zeros. And now they're they're, right. they're seeing something more there. And Jordan immediately jumps to, well, so it, that's a justification for freedom of speech, freedom of action, which I thought was like that. That was like, whoa, that was a big jump <laughs> because that's, he's, he's, uh, he's really set on that issue. And, uh, and that's where John Verveke brings up the Bernardo Castrop thing that Bernardo Castrop has come to the plate has pointed out that you can't reduce consciousness to physicalism. And uh, Bernardo Castro 
claims consciousness as the ultimate reality, although John doesn't agree with him on that, but John does think that Castro has some valid ways of thinking at least. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he takes it pretty seriously. So right. um, then they come to this place at about 110, and I want to play this clip. So um, I don't need to share with you. So let's just see here. Of course, I can't find the screen now. There it is. Okay. Here's the conversation. I apologize, I didn't have this set up beforehand. I had a long conversation that's gonna post in a couple of days with somebody else and that got me a little bit behind. I think it starts about here. You know, they're not paying attention to, I mean, when Nietzsche runs into the marketplace, he- Right here in my backpack oh, is the final answer- <laughs> Sorry to about the ad, news, folks. And here it is. This is the patriot. He is talking to the atheists when he says, you don't know what you've done when you've killed God, right? And, and so to, to think that religion is primarily about asserting propositions for which there is no evidence is to miss all of the non propositions So I make a distinction, and it, it lines up with this. Uh, you know, I think that religion is not primarily about knowledge. I think it's primarily about wisdom. Because wisdom is about that fundamental. It's about embodying it. As Pardon me. It's it's about embodying it. It's about establishing a relationship with it. It's, yes. It's, it's about, about worshiping it. It's about taking it into your identity. That's, that's what I the meant. worship, I think. So I wanted to stop here for just a second because this is evangelical language. Yes. <laughs> right. Except right. that Jordan says it's about embodying it. It's about establishing a relationship with it. It's about worshiping it. So you replace it with Jesus. This is evangelical language. Yeah. Completely. And then and then John says, yes, it's about taking it into your identity. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I mean, that, 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 that very much is down the line of the two worlds mythology, right? If you if you think about the two worlds mythology as materialism and non-materialism or something, right? Or etherealism or whatever then yeah, all the things that, that John talks about that are types of knowing that are non-propositional aren't going to involve materialism. Non-propositional knowledge doesn't involve materialism. And I think John doesn't say that, but that's true, right? So uh, that's how it works out. And, and he kind of dances around it. And he does that a lot, or he keeps dancing around that issue to some extent, because he, you know, what do you call that? He doesn't want to he doesn't want to be in the religious frame. He doesn't want to be an evangelical and like, fair enough, like neither do I. Um, yeah. But th that's what happened as the result. Well, I, I probably shouldn't have said, I probably shouldn't have said specifically evangelical language, but it's Christian language to, to, em to embody Christ, to, uh, to worship Christ, to develop a relationship with Christ. That's, that's specifically Christian language. Right. Um, right. And, but they're talking here about wisdom, so they're using it, yes. right? Yes. Well, I mean, I think I think they're 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 each using. Well, Jordan's just sneaky, so he's probably using it in two senses at once because he likes to do that. Uh, we see him do that all the time. Uh, but but John's specifically referring to the the you know the thing that's most relevant to you in the moment or something, right? Like the thing that that is shining forth. They go into that later, but. That's, they're talking about that same idea that relevance realization is pointing you in a direction. And that's the thing you're going after because it's, um, uh, you know, because that's the thing you think is the most important that you're holding in the highest esteem, right? And so Jordan's linking relevant, John's relevance realization to esteem basically is what's happening. And they keep doing this. They, they, he actually makes that connection a few times to John before John acquiesces and says, no, no, no that's right. That's, you know, now, hold so, on. You said John is linking relevant. Jordan is linking John's relevance realization to what? Esteem. Esteem. Right. Because he needs it back in the hierarchy. Right. Because Jordan. Now, I've hierarchy. never, I don't know that I've ever heard Jordan use the word esteem. Well, in what context? 
Well, Jordan right here says it's about embodying it, right? Worship. And John says, yes, celebration. Oh, oh it's what highest. you hold in highest esteem. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Not, not the self-esteem thing, but what you hold in right. highest esteem. Okay, yeah, that's where, okay. So let's, let's go on from here because it gets pretty good here for the next couple of minutes. Uh, well, I think and, well, jo you, Jonathan described worship as celebration. So it's a celebration reverence. of and, and reverence. reverence. Well, reverence for sure. But the celebration part is, is interesting because to what you celebrate is what you hold in highest esteem and to hold something in highest esteem is to pursue, pursue it in the hopes of embodying it. But, but and we, that's worship. But we, yeah, but we've lost, well, maybe this, maybe this is to your point about worship. We've lost the depth of celebration. We have reduced yeah, it. Yeah, you to see it in, you theory. see it in black gospel music, don't you? And then it runs into rock and roll from there. But, and then so I wanted to go back just a second to where he says, uh, what you hold in highest esteem, you pursue it in hopes of embodying it. And that's worship. Right. So obviously he's talking here about the ideal situation because right. because you can also do that with you know rock stars and sports stars and you can do that with drugs or alcohol or right they go uh, into that they go into that specifically right they draw a line between transformative things and entertainment roughly speaking, and it's very interesting. Oh, you think that all those things would be in the category of entertainment? No, they say that explicitly further. Well, I talk. know that I yeah. I was thinking when they were talking about entertainment, they were talking more about the uh, the means of worship, not what nope. you're worshiping, but the means of worship. Nope, they were talking about what you worship. And, and they were saying, look, there's all this entertainment and you're actually, and Jordan actually explicitly says it. Yeah, you're actually worshiping when that goal goes in, right? You're actually worshiping the high, he actually, I think at one point, well, I would call it slips up and says God, like you're worshiping God when you see that goal. It's like, what? Wait, what did you say? Hold on, right? Because that's the highest ideal in the moment. So he's linking the, the ideal in the moment all the way back up. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So. So when the goal goes in, you're worshiping the moment or the the uh, the accomplishment, the the human victory. Right. He's linking that to God. Yep. Yeah, he definitely does that later on. He he slips up and actually says God. I think at one point uh -huh. when he's talking about a sporting event. So what do you think about that? What do you think about connecting the 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 human the moment of human victory to the concept of God? Um well, I mean that's his shit. Come on, commit yourself. <laughs> I I don't know that it's wrong, uh right? I mean it, it, if if you take seriously the idea that that there's an ought and that the oughts exists, we'll say in the religious sphere, roughly speaking, right? And then that is what determines everything like science, everything subordinate to that, right? Because we have to have a name, right? We have to go after something, then, uh, then yes, anytime we see somebody not miss or hit the target, right? Actually get accomplished what they're going for, we are worshiping the transcendent. That doesn't sound wrong to me, that certainly could be true. Well, because that, that's um, very, it is not concordant with what he says later and what he had said in an earlier talk with Roger Scruton, that you come into contact with the transcendent when you err. Not, um, in, not in the moment of victory, but in the moment of error. Well, is coming into contact the same as worshiping? Right. And I would say it's not. You come into contact when you err because oh. you bump into the transcendent. You're worshiping uh, it because uh -huh. it manifests in victory. Ah, OK. 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 That's fair. I'll take that. Um, so they go on and they talk about this for quite a bit. Um, the phenomenon, trivializing the phenomenon so that they can critique it. 
And then they get to this section, I'll skip over here a little bit. They get to this section at 113. Well, they, out. they interestingly, so they, they bring up knowing through consciousness, which is John's perspectival, right? And he talks about salience landscaping, right? And then Jordan links that back to drawing to attention. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then that that he links that and John links that to participate in it. And then Jordan says the dance between revelation and dialogical the, yeah. evaluation. Yeah. That's the part I wanted to play here because yeah. jo John says you participate in it. You don't just attend and you don't just receive. You right. participate top down and bottom up. He might actually be saying that right here. Knowing that is right dependent on your state of consciousness. There's a knowing through consciousness. And that's what I call perspectival knowing for, uh, for the, what consciousness does is it foregrounds some things, backgrounds others, makes things some right. things salient. So it's doing, if you'll allow me a term I coined, it, it's doing salience landscaping for you. And what that does is- Yes, that, is that drawing things to your attention? Yes, drawing or, things but, to your But your attention always also does that. So is that part of that? Because you kind of you kind of choose where your attention goes. You choose well, it, but you, sort you of, right? Or you, you follow it. You participate in it. You participate in attention. That's what I. That's what I was saying. You don't just attend, and you don't just receive. You participate. You both, there's both. You know, and they use these metaphors without. You know, I think fully unpacking them. You know, there's the top down okay. and bottom. Do you up think aspects. that it, is that it, that a part is that participatory attention akin to the dance between revelation and and criti criticism? So I, is, I it, is it revelation and dialogical evaluation that constitutes the participatory true. or element of of attention? Yeah. Okay, I want to stop and just a little bit on that one. I'm going to um, maybe bring us back so we can talk about this. Because that's pretty deep. That was pretty deep. That was a huge leap that he made right there. And, uh, and the, the way that I understood it was through the lens of something I had just read um, about the work of Dorothy Sayers. I don't know if you're familiar with her at all. I know her, but I don't know her work that well. Okay. Um, so let's go over this again. <laughs> the They were just talking about consciousness. And uh, part, he's talking about participatory, or is he still talking about perspectival? That's perspective. Knowing through consciousness is perspectival for John's model. And then Jordan says, do you think it's that is akin to the dance between revelation and criticism right and then he right. changes that to dialogical evaluation instead of criticism which i find an interesting correction on his part yeah so so here's the thing from dorothy sayers um she wrote a book called the mind of the maker mm -hmm. and these are a couple of quotes from it <clears throat> This might actually this might be from the intro written by uh, Madeline Madeline Lengel wrote the intro to this book. <clears throat> Fantasy from the pen of a great writer is indeed a result of the creative imagination. Confusion arises when the writer of fantasy feels that this genre has no rules and rejects the necessity of self criticism. Sayers writes. The notion that self-criticism is necessarily a clog upon inspiration is quite erroneous and is honored only in the mind of the fifth-rate poetaster. Creative criticism is the spirit's continual response to its own creation. Mm. Now, if you'll, if you'll allow me to continue just a moment longer. Creative criticism usually has the result of turning the artist's attitudes towards the work from lordship to servanthood. Sayers also says, the only way of mastering one's material is to abandon the whole concept of mastery and to cooperate with it in love. Whosoever will be a lord of life, let him be its servant. So let's take that back and look at this quote from these guys, okay? akin to the dance between revelation and criticism. Criticism comes in and turns the artist's attitude towards the work from lordship to servanthood. 
Now I think about this and I, I don't know what it's like for a writer, but for me as a painter, when I'm painting and I come to a place where I'm just so upset with the painting. <laughs> it's like, it's it yeah. adolescent stage. Everything is bad. It's ugly. I don't know what to do with it. But if I look at it with the eyes of love, this sounds weird, but it will begin to tell me how to serve it to bring out the best of what's there. Uh -huh. and, and I think that's what he's talking about when he's talking about the dance between revelation and criticism. Oh, yeah. So the criticism would be the ideal is the judge. Mm -hmm. And so we're always under this criticism. And yet this ideal that is the judge is simultaneously the servant that is there to bring about the revelation of us into a completeness, right? Right. Or well, the revelation of potential. Yes. Yeah, and I like the reframing from the word criticism back to dialogical evaluation, right? Because that that really ties with John's work and with Dialogos, right? And and that so yeah. like I said, Jordan keeps doing this. He's 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 actually tracking three things and their connection, the connection between the three things. He's doing that live in real time, this whole conversation. He had a plan going in. He knew exactly what he needed to ask John. He knew exactly what John could answer, answer for him in some sense, or at least critique, right? Or at least having a dialogical evaluation of, a dialogos about maybe. And uh -huh. I think that's why this is dialogos because Jordan went in going, yeah, we're going to critique this, this bad boy and find out what's there. And I find it very interesting that John's work is all around Dialogos and Dialogos and critique are at least very close, if not much the same thing. And I think that's why he takes the postmoderns too seriously, in my opinion. But yeah, it's interesting. Well, so a while back, um, Michael made the comment and I can't remember who he was talking about, but whoever he was talking about, he said, I think they're making the mistake of confusing critique with creativity. Um, critique is a component. Not, not these guys. He, he was talking about some other, maybe like the progressives or somebody was making the mistake of, of criticizing, of uh, confusing critique with creation, critique with creativity. Like earlier when Jordan was talking about, you trivialize something so that you can criticize it. You trivialize the phenomenon so that you can critique it. Right. So that's one side of it. But then on the other side of it, there is this kind of dialogical evaluation that takes seriously the improvement of the whatever this substrate is, like if it's a painting or if it's a work of art or if it's a right. person. If you if you take seriously and granted its dignity, then dialogical evaluation is saying tell me what you need tell me how to help you be what you can be exactly so right? there's maybe, a conversation maybe, going on there maybe the difference between critique and dialogical evaluation is they're exactly the same process except one's in in assumes a trivialization and the other assumes an approve an improvement like accepts the value wow, and i like that i like that you can put that in your model <laughs> I will, uh, I will discuss this with my team. So uh, the models, the models are, uh, are getting up there. Yeah. So, so, and, and, and that's interesting because that would explain the postmoderns. And mm -hmm. if you take something like critique is creativity or something like that, or close to creativity seriously, which would be a really pretty, in my opinion, silly mistake to make, um, then yeah, I can see why you'd give any well, because it's so much postmodernism. It's so much easier to critique than it is to create. Oh, exactly. Oh, right. right. It's easy to the, the guy, everything. the guy who can't cook becomes a food critic. <laughs> right. Well, it's easy to trivialize everybody else's work because yeah. it helps our ego. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's true. Plus, everything that's been done is trivialized. The, the process of doing things is simplification, right? So when you validate something by doing it in the world, the end result is the end result. And nobody knows how many hours went into this cup. Maybe you know how many hours went into manufacturing this particular version of this particular cup. That's not how many hours went into the cup. 
right? Because there's material science, right? Or pre-material science even, right? There's, there's all the design of the cup throughout thousands of years of cup making, right? There's all kinds of things. And then there's the fact that this cup is designed a certain way for a specific type of surface. Because in the old days, all the, uh, all the cups and bowls were rounded bottom for a reason because they had to sit on uneven surfaces. Right, and, and we don't have that. So we have flat, flat bottom. Like there's so much that goes into this that's trivialized by our brain. Cause we're like, no, 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 there's a machine and they just stamp out cups and the, the machine stamped out that cup. It's a trivial thing. It's like, uh, I don't know. There's thousands of years of development going on there and, and the materials alone, like that's like endless. And we trivialize everything around us cause we take it for granted, right? Did you ever read that essay, I Pencil by Leonard Reed or Lawrence Reed? No, I don't think I have. Oh, it, it does exactly that. It takes a pencil and then it goes into what it takes to make a pencil. And you just would not believe, but you probably would. But um, thousands of people and thousands of years and, you know, gajillions of resources and just unbelievable in a simple thing like a pencil. And, and we, we diminish it all like, oh, it's just a pencil. We throw them away, you know? Yeah, exactly. Five cents, right? Living off the bones of our ancestors, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so they go on from there, and they're talking about. Um, oh, th this is good. Maybe we should just continue on at the same spot because they're talking about predicting, and anticipation and desire. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's worth hashing hashing over, or should we just move on? I mean, I can summarize it. Uh, fairly quickly, right? Because John's talking about uh, realization as the dialogue between, you know, imagination and your true predictions, right? And, and, and so there's this whole dialogue going on inside your head, which causes the relevance realization. Oh, does this match the world? No, then your imagination sucks. Try again, imagination, <laughs> right? And so he's, he's giving life to the concept of the imaginal. Um, and the, they're, they're using that and they talk about, Peterson goes into, oh, wait a minute. So, so we see the map, but not the territory, but we see the errors in the map. It's like, yes. And then John's like, yeah. And then we use that to stitch together a globe, which is still not correct. It's still not an accurate portrayal of the world, but it's better than a map. And so you don't need to see the territory. Right, because you don't have full access to it, like this phenomenology. You don't have full access to it. You only have access to your senses, right? To your version of whatever's coming at you. And so there's this whole dialogue between your imagination, which is a prediction machine, but it's not a trivial thing because your imagination has to make correct predictions or you wouldn't be here. And so it's not a simple thing, right? This goes into Jung and right, not trivializing the imagination as such. And that's why John likes imaginal. Right, because he, he he likes to take things more seriously. He uses serious play. Right, he likes to he likes to oh, add and, that and scientific. He, and he's component. using some of Friston's language from predictive processing. Right, because the interesting thing about Friston's predictive processing is that even in the very elemental creatures or you know cells or whatever, there have they have to have a map in order to make predictions. <laughs> they have exactly. some sort of a in in fact the map has to proceed. This is what's mysterious or unexplainable to me is that there the map has to precede the predictive mechanisms so so we have this predictive processing going on and um john goes on later to say that they're not using the language of prediction anymore they're using the language of anticipation but but we can get into that but before we get there i want to stop at the globe issue mm -hmm. because i think that John short-circuited something that Jordan was going to say. John pulls it out and says, you know, yeah, even though there's some errors, we can, it's a globe rather than a map. So it, it's at least a little bit better, but I don't think that's what Jordan was going for at all. No, no, because, no. He said, depends where the territory pushes through. So he was going back yes. to the golden thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's he where says, he was going. He says, the errors are where the territory pushes its nose through. And then this is where he had this talk with Roger Scruton a number of years ago. They were talking about the transcendent and, the, and beauty. And in that talk, he said the transcendent is where wh what we meet when we err. Right. When, when you come to the limits of your knowledge or when you, when you fall into error, that's when you meet the transcendent. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, because you're off the path. 
Yeah. Right. Otherwise, otherwise you're, you're, you're on your way to meet the transcendent. When you fall off, you meet them immediately. Like, oh, wait a minute. So, so I don't think the territory is anything like a globe. <laughs> the territory is very big and very... Um, no, no, and John doesn't think so either. He just says, look, you got a bunch of flat maps and then you're sort of forming them into a globe and that's better. That's really the only statement. He's, mm -hmm. he's very humble about that, about that claim. And then something extremely, in my opinion, extremely interesting happens, right? Which is, so that, then John interrupts with this globe comment when, when Jordan was going after the golden thread. And Jordan goes back to maps need to be adequately accurate. We have molded ourselves to reality. Men and women select each other for the manifestation of the logos. And John is completely just bashed by this. He looks up and says, wow. So well, wouldn't anybody be because first he says, we're molding ourselves to reality. And I've heard him talk about this before. He has a wonderful video on tragedy versus evil that he did like oh, eight yeah. years ago. Yes. And in that, he actually almost comes right out and says that God is reality. Reality is God. Right. He, he makes a statement that's right in that wheelhouse. And so when he says, we're looking for this adequate representation of reality, we're trying to align ourselves with that, which is good. I mean, I think that's basically what he's trying to say. So we've molded ourselves to reality. And then he just like out of left field comes in with this thing. <laughs> Men and women select each other for manifestation. of. I mean, it's really not left field if you're looking through John, Jordan's lens. But right. on John's lens, that's really out of left field. Right. Well, John never wants to go there. That's part of the problem. That's why when he talks to Pedro and, and Pastor Paul Vanderclay, right, they, they, they always stump him, basically. John's always learning. He says this. I'm always learning new things when I talk to Pedro and, and, and people in that camp, right? It's like, yeah, because these are the things you're not considering in your model at all, right? And so, he, but, but he saw it. Like, he actually saw it, which is, you know, super unusual. John's a pretty cool cool as a cucumber guy right he's he's very level-headed but that he just got completely taken out by that to some to some extent and then they go on with the silly football reference which i still think is silly but not not incorrect it's just a little over the top even for jordan i think he gets a little carried away there and not suitable for work <laughs> yeah definitely not but but i like you know then he makes the comment about because being a follower is better than being a part and and you know it, it's that's the animating spirit. That's what drives consciousness. So he says, look, you're better off being with the top dog, right? Than being a part. So you might as well celebrate the best in your field, right? The quarterback, whatever, the guy who did better than you did. You might as well, because then you're in with them and you have a chance to follow in their footsteps and you have a judge and an ideal, right? You've got all that, right? That's all mm -hmm. built in and you're not alone. And I think he doesn't stress that enough. Like, yeah, you're not alone. You're actually in with the crew. So that's why you celebrate the guy better than you, even though you want to be that guy and you're not, right? Well, and right after that, he says something that I, maybe you can unwind for me because I don't, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with it. So maybe I'm not, not seeing it correctly, but he says maybe it's random variation on the option side, but maybe not on the selection side. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just note that right after... Jordan makes the makes the comment that the, the fundamental animating spirit is being together with people, you know, in the transcendent. John actually sits back in his chair and has to think. So he gets blown away twice in like a minute, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, whoa, wait a minute, what's all this? Because Jordan's doing this large linking from these little topics back up his thread, the golden thread, maybe, right? Back up his thread in, in his higher theme. And then yeah. He, 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 he goes into this whole thing about option size uh, has to be random, but selection size doesn't. And so- And how can that be? I mean, I don't understand how that can be because it's actually really, if, it's, it's, if it's not random on the selection side, the selection side is selecting. So whatever it selects can't be random. So generation after generation, you can't have randomness on the option side while you have not randomness on the selection side. I don't get it. No, you, what no, am I you missing? Can. You, you can, you can. So the option side is a field of potential of infinite randomness. 
right? So I was thinking a lot about this, right? Because there's this whole problem around how does, how does a number set sufficiently large with a truly random number generator generate order? Because it does. I mean, they, they discovered that there's a paper on it, it's two, three, four years old at most, I think, right? So they know this is true. Taleb talks about this. Nassim Taleb mm -hmm. talks about this too. And so when you get a large enough space, order appears. The thing about order, and this ties back to where they were initially, is that order perpetuates itself definitionally. It's a self-organizing system. Like any order in this, this is like the game of life and the rules of the game of life, which is an open-ended, it's a famous open-ended computer game. There's lots of YouTube talks about mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, right? I'm because, familiar with it. Because no one can predict what it's gonna do from the starting conditions. But possible. what I'm saying is if order is perpetuating itself, then at a certain point, you no longer have randomness on the option side. No, because the field of potential is larger than the field of ordered potential. I, so potential is still expanding. That's all it says. Yeah. And it has to expand. It has to expand sufficiently to contain the ordered side plus the random additions. I yeah. like that. I like that. No, I've, that gives me a lot of pictures because it, right. it, 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 right. it, well, I mean, obviously we know that the universe is expanding and we know that, yeah. and we know that we You're know not. that the part beyond what the universe has, has expanded into is there for the universe to expand into. Although, I mean, this, we this, don't know how. Say it's not expanding into anything. It's just expanding. Okay. Exactly. <clears throat> But in the, and then the you have mystery. you have this um, increasing entropy, which has to have some place to to be. <laughs> right. Well, and, and also yeah. keep in mind that the older structures do decay because there is decay, and so there's space there too. Like you can go back into the past and get chaos and revivify it. And I think it's the process of revivification that's linked into what we do. We'll say in the moment, right? I talked before about maybe what we do, like the process of us existing and there's no present moment. It's just a process of validating history. Like maybe maybe you there's a larger process on top of that where you have to go back into, into the past and rescue the rescue your father from the belly of the whale, which they go into later, right? In this section, mm -hmm. and I think that's true. Like that process is at all levels continually going on. And so that's there's- That rewriting of the story. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Right. Right. That's why we have to rewrite our myths and legends. It's not it's not strictly because the language changes, although it's that, too. But it's also because we need to go back and re-understand the past in in a better intelligible way that fits more with where we're at in the cycle of the present. Well, because when we err and we bump up against the transcendent and when we suffer, we learn and we grow and we adapt. And that changes our perspective on what has already happened. And so we're right. constantly why, rewriting the past in that way. And that's why we that's need the a flexible text. adaptivity, right? Right, right. But that's what John talks about when he talks about sacredness, the ability to go back to the text because I've changed and get mm -hmm. more out of it, even though I already read it. It's like, yes. And he talks about that in terms of reading for transformation instead of information, which is something he goes right. over in his meditation course. Yeah. So I don't know if we want to go into this whole thing about um, anticipation versus desire. Did that strike you as interesting at all? Well, it kind of is. I mean, I think I think one of the big flaws that we have in society is people keep saying, look, we move away from from harm and towards pleasure. And I'm like, hey, that's not true. It's not even remote. Like, what, who came up with that? Like, duh. No, we don't. Oh, isn't that Tony? What's his name? Tony Robbins. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Like yeah. They Tony all do. Robbins. <laughs> it's a nice. It's a nice dichotomous simple model. It's just wrong. Like, it's evolutionarily not required. Evolution only requires that you survive, not that you're happy. It's like, so all these people go evolution, evolution, evolution. And I'm like, do you, did you not read any evolution? Do you not understand evolution? It doesn't. Evolution doesn't say anything about happiness. Evolution only says survival, which is why we have a negativity bias, because we just have to live. We don't have to live well. We just have to survive. We don't have to survive well. We just have to continue long enough. And what's enough? Well, I don't know, right? But enough for humans is longer than enough for chimps, because grandparents matter in human uh, societal models and behavioral models and the, all the advancement models, interestingly, whereas they're not a factor in other animal models as near as anybody can tell. 
So that's interesting all by itself, but it points to the fact that we only have to live. We don't have to live well. This whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs has really messed everybody up. So that's the, that's the other thing Peterson noticed, by the way, that, that I forgot about that, that I was like, I thought I was the only one that noticed. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Peterson says, means that the wealthy people are necessarily more ethical and he doesn't believe that. And I'm like, right on, I agree. Wealthy people are not more, because they would have to be because more of their needs are filled. Right. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that's a misuse of his hierarchy of needs, whatever. That's the way people think about it. And that's why using it is a bad thing to do. Like, don't, mm -hmm. don't pay any attention to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's not concurrent with evolutionary theory at all. It's just, well, I don't care whether it's concurrent with evolutionary theory or not. A long time ago, I figured out there's a lot of holes in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but the reason I brought up anticipation and desire is that. John was talking about the cognitive science model moving from predictive processing to the idea of anticipation. And Jordan immediately jumped to desire. That's desire. Yes. Right. So right, what do you see as the connection between anticipation and desire? So, the, so yeah, there's a, there's a big difference between these two things, right? So actually the way the CogSci models work, like, um, well, at least in terms of AI, we'll say, uh, I've done a lot of work with AI. So the way AI generally works is it, it, it's trying to figure out something and there's supervised and unsupervised learning and but with supervised learning, which is the easiest one to understand, you give it a bunch of things you want it to see or understand or patterns you want it to recognize. And then you train it on those patterns Right? And then there's various processes you can do in the middle to improve or, or you know, make it better or worse or whatever, right? and cut, cut half the thing out. And there's all kinds of crazy things, because right? mm -hmm. it's a wacky system, uh, the, the black box AI systems. But ultimately, they're trying to anticipate these things. right? But the, the, di the real difference is that what you need evolutionarily is only to anticipate the bad things which is a much larger and less well-defined set. But in order to move forward, you need a desire. You can't have an anticipation because desire says it's an undefined potential in the future. Whereas anticipation says it's a specific manifestation in the future. So okay. it's kind of like- just, Hold on just a second. Desire okay. is an undefined potential? Potential, undefined, yes. Undefined potential in the future. Yes. Right. So it's, it's the difference between being hungry and wanting a sandwich. Okay. Right? I want a sandwich. I'm anticipating I can get a sandwich, but if I'm just hungry and I'll be happy with a freaking apple, then, <laughs> then my desire is for the hunger. My anticipation is for the sandwich. So when, uh, when John goes in and starts talking about, or when Jordan goes in and starts talking about, then he jumps right into motivation and affect. Right. Because motivation and affect is a hierarchical structure with a central organizing spirit that drives towards unity. And it is predicated upon the idea of attentional focus itself. Right. So Jordan is jumping from, um, the predictive processing to motivation and affect. Right. Because you're not trying to predict necessarily. Affect, affect would be the hunger and motivation right. would be wanting a sandwich. Motivation would be striving for the sandwich. Maybe, yeah. It doesn't sound entirely wrong. It doesn't match up perfectly either, right? Because it's not going to. Well, but I'm, but what does he mean when he says motivation and affect? I mean, he jumped right to that and he said, it's a hierarchical structure with a central organizing spirit that drives towards unity. So, <clears throat> I mean, that's telos. It's just <laughs> telos all over the place. Yes, yes. <laughs> so right. he's, he's giving motivation and affect a teleological structure right and when then later on he goes into motivation and affect being the root of personality and yes he thinks that john hasn't stumbled on yet somehow <clears throat> which that seemed weird to me haven't the cog side people figured out that no 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 john, john fully admits that they haven't 
right? He said, they're just getting there now, basically, is what he's saying. So in other words, common sense precedes science and science is just validating yes, science common is validation. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Science, is science says science is validation. People don't realize that's what science is, but they, you know, look, uh, science is supposed to start from observation. So observation is definitionally common sense, right? It's something you saw. Like, so you take it for granted because you saw it or observed it in some way. So you take it for granted. And Einstein kind of ruined all that, but that's a different story, um, right? By making a bunch of predictions and then proceeding as if they were true before they were ever proven, right? And it just turned out that he was right about most of them, we'll say, or a number of them anyway. So that, that sort of broke science. Physics broke science in some sense, but, but the actual science is supposed to come from observation, not the other way around. This is the point at which Jordan gets kind of, I, I use the word angry, maybe, maybe just extremely anxious. Um, the, the, the spirit that drives toward unity is predicated upon the idea of attentional focus itself. Right. What do you hold in highest esteem? That's what directs your attention, right? And he's yes. like so intense at that moment. What do you hold in highest esteem? That's what directs your attention, right? So I think what he's saying is, to me, here's what he's saying, that you have to have a value structure or you can't move forward. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the COGSI people, especially if you look at Friston's predictive processing stuff and Mark Solm's book on, on the, the, um, the foundations of consciousness, the idea is that this very simple value structure of hot, cold, you know, strictly hungry, not hungry, that kind of thing, that consciousness arose out of that. Right. And I think Jordan is saying, no, 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 there has to be a higher, higher goal first. Otherwise, you can't move forward. You can't, right. you can't get there with just these very simple. Right, right, because they're using a binary model. And the binary model, as we discussed earlier, is wrong. Like, there's no way that's evolution doesn't say any of that. Evolution says that things just survive, but we don't just survive. We strive. Why do we strive? What's causing that? And right after that, right? What does Peterson say? He says this is fundamentally religious. Yes, it's a religious. Fundamentally frame. a religious question. I agree. The motivations, the oughts, are religious questions. They're ethical concerns. They're not. They're not concerns around anything but, but ethical concerns. And ethical concerns involve the hierarchy of virtues, which determines the hierarchy of values. And then, then this is, I guess that's where John says is that's the shift from prediction to anticipation. Right. And then they start discussing whether or not they've gotten on to personality theory. And Jordan says, well, I certainly hope so, because you need to be talking about that. And uh, Right. And John's like, it's not quite personality theory, but the notion of self and what it is, it's organizing principle. Right? And then he and says like, that the oh. bridge is attention, precision waiting, because you can't privilege everything, you know, which right. you know. You have to privilege certain predictions, certain anticipations, and that's what attention is. Um, so then they go on to, um, then Jordan says, Pajot would say the basis of worship is what directs attention. Right. That's a hell of a thing to say because the apex of attention has this drive towards unity that's right. personal, and that's personality. John so, interrupted in that to agree, by the way. So John's on the same page as Jordan when he's talking about worship. And do you and, think every time he says he agrees that he actually agrees, or is he just being um, no, no, accommodating? No, John's not being a no, no, they're too in flow. There's no way, there's no way he could do that. Okay. You can tell when people, even Canadians, they're sneaky, but you can tell when they do that. <laughs> they're very deliberate about it, right? And, or at least I can tell, maybe, maybe everybody can't see it. I can see it rather clearly when they do it. They're very deliberate about it when they agree to be polite. But John's not even, jo John, to be fair, is less Canadian than most Canadians, or at least he tries to be. And, and, and I think it works out most of the time. But in this case, they're too far in flow. I mean, he's literally interrupting Jordan mid-sentence to agree. You don't do that to be polite. Like you wait if you're being polite because you're being polite, mm -hmm. right? So especially Canadians. 
Well, so I see this parallel between what Jordan just said. The apex of attention has this drive towards unity. Yep. And the thing he said earlier is the, yep. the uh, motivation and affect is the hierarchical structure with a central organizing spirit that drives towards unity. Right. And, and then in the second time, the apex of attention has this drive towards unity, and that's personality. Right. So motivation and affect is personality. This is personality. So he's just saying the same thing, but he's saying it with a different terminology here. Or he's tying a lot up in personality. Yeah. Which, which he would like, you know, he has a course on, on uh, personality theory, right? So, which I watched, it's lovely by the way. And, and interestingly though, you know, when John interrupts and agrees, Peterson switches and said, that's a hell of a thing to say. These are religious claims. So he's trying mm -hmm. to explain to John, no, 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 John, you're making religious claims. You keep, you keep running away from religious claims, but you're making religious claims. Yes. Yeah. And then John switches to sacredness at this point, right? The sequence of episodes, sacredness, and how to build it. So in, in the Waking from the Meaning Crisis uh, series, he has a few episodes that lay out sacredness and how to build sacredness out of attention and relevance realization, right? And then he, you know, his his thesis is it's seeking to bind us to ourselves, each other, and the world, right? And doesn't Jordan make some comment at that point, like, "Wow, that's really great, John." Well, well said, hooray! Admiration is the instinct to emulate. We worship the most emulatable. Who, what would be the most emulatable in Christian terms, Karen? Because I'm not a Christian. You'll have to tell me. But like, even I see that. Like, I can tell what he's talking about there. Well, the thing I found kind of interesting is when John made that switch over and started talking about sacredness, it's like he went immediately into um, professor mode, very calm, very yep. deliberate. It's like, okay, I was getting too excited there. <laughs> Well, no, he's again he's trying, to, a little bit. <laughs> he's trying to pull it out of the religious because John's yeah, like, yeah. John, you just made a religious claim. John's like, oh, no, no, we can't make religious yeah, claims. I know. Religion bad. Like, like, oh, we need written art. We need this religion that's not a religion. We got to, we got to get back into professor mode. Yeah, absolutely. I totally saw yeah. that. Too. Yeah. And so then, so then when Jordan starts talking about, we look for the most emulatable, John jumps right in with Gerard is right. Mimetic envy, covetousness. And, and Jordan says- he tries to demonize religion immediately. He specifically says the problem with religion is, right? And goes into this whole thing about covetousness, right? Right. And then Jordan says, we think we can possess it by ill-gotten means. That's the story of Cain. Right. And, and of course, that's also the story of Eve, Adam and Eve, yes. completely. The story of human history. And- Jordan says that too. It's the story of human history, the fundamental thing that's tearing us apart. Which is why I asked about culture war, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what people don't get. There's no culture war. That's not a thing. We're fighting for the, for the ethical salvation of the human race. That's what we're fighting because we have a bunch of people who think they have ethics, but they do not. Like Sam Harris has no ethics. Sorry, he can't answer ethical questions. He's unethical. Definitionally, it's just the way the word works, right? And a bunch of people are like that. The atheists believe they can answer ethical questions using science and it can't be done. And they repeatedly can't do it, right? They're despite every opportunity, and they can't explain any of this stuff. And none of it works in a computer simulation. None of it. It doesn't even come close either. Like I've done the actual experiments myself on my computers. And I have a lot of computers. And it, none of it comes close. It can't even come close. And that's, you know, it's very much the conceit of these people. I actually commented, John had commented on a thread on one of the videos he did, I think, with Paul. And I commented on, on that thread as well. And I pointed out, I said, you know, you guys and your pattern recognition, like you can put an, a nearly invisible sticker on a stop sign and those little cars won't see the stop sign. And I said, so like, if you're talking about good pattern recognition, like humans can't even see the damn sticker. So they still see the stop sign. The car literally goes right through the stop sign and they've done the math. There's an infinite number nearly of ways to do that to the computer that humans cannot even see. So they don't fall for it at all. 
and, and John actually backed up and, and said, no, 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 but AI does pattern recognition really well. And I'm kind of like, well, what's your definition of really well? Because <laughs> if I could put an invisible sticker on a stop sign and your stupid computer can't see it, you're just going to kill a lot of people. I don't think that's good pattern recognition. I could be wrong. I, I guess it depends on your values. <laughs> But in my book, that's very bad pattern recognition. And people well, that have goes, done that. That goes back to what uh, Peterson used to always talk about with the problem with AI is that it, it can't see because it's not embodied. Embodied, right, right. And, but even when you embody it because of the way it works, and this is where it gets into you, uh, one of the techniques that they're using, it's, I don't know how new it is now because I, 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 read I read all this stuff when it was being developed. So I don't know when it hit the pop culture or whatever, but what they were doing was they were they were taking the neural net and they literally just cut random 50 connections out of it, half 50 percent of the connections right out of the neural net and it would improve performance they don't know why they stumbled across that as an accident nobody did a math calculation oh if we it, it never happened so they don't know how this stuff works it's all black box not not all the ai because black box, just adding in random noise improves things right <laughs> Well, or 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 there or there, uh, the, uh, part of the problem is when you fit to a set of things, you're fitting to a larger set of things that you don't know about, and it's the things you don't know about that cause the problem, right? Because you're training it on it. Let's say you were train you couldn't do this, but let's say you were training on a set of fifty items, right? The number of things that will fit the same uh, item pattern as the fifty items you put in is. You know, maybe it's not infinite, but it's probably a trillion, right? It's, it's probably a really big number because there's all these combinations you don't care about. But because you don't care about the combinations, you don't even see them because that's how humans work. And so we don't know, but the computer doing math, it just sees random combinations, but you don't know what it sees because it's doing math that you can't understand, basically. And so who knows what it's seeing and what it's not seeing? Like, I don't understand. I don't understand. And I understand this stuff pretty darn well. I'm a technical guy. Like I've done the math for a lot of these. I can't do math that well, but like, I understand the, the functions, the sigmoid functions and the soft max and all the little algorithms that they use. I know all those algorithms pretty well. I can't understand why putting a nearly invisible sticker on a stop sign that I think it's this bit, I think it's six inches by six inches or something too, um, causes the computer not to see it. Like, I don't know what that is. Like, that's really strange to me because it doesn't seem to matter too much where you put it on the sign either, which is really queer. Like, well, what does that say about the, what the computer is actually picking up for patterns? Because it should just be picking up red, you know, thing, right? Like, because when we see it, we go, oh yeah, yeah, if you pick up these three items, but, it, but it's actually more complicated than that. What you have to do with the stop sign is pick the background noise out. Yes, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It has to do with the background, foreground. Push they don't do thing. it. They don't do it. And so I think what's happening is it's seeing the sticker as background, and then it's saying, well, then it can't be the pattern because there's background in the middle or mm -hmm. something like that. That's my yeah. best guess. But no, that, that's know. totally what I would say just based on the way that I see patterns with when I'm doing artwork. But I want to step back just a second. You went into a little bit of a rant earlier about the people who don't see things the way you see them mm -hmm. and uh and that there is a whole bunch of people like sam harris and, and a lot of the atheists and and others that have this skewed view of reality and and that we're in an existential fight for the salvation of the human race basically i think is the way that you put it yes some, something close to that yeah yes well okay so i immediately see a very significant danger there of of that radical of uh, polarization of viewpoints to say there's us and there's them, and those people are threatening this the uh, the future of the human race. I don't I don't think it's us and them. No. Like we're all in this. Like it doesn't really matter who. Like it doesn't matter how many losses we have because it's a loss for all of us. Like every okay. person not okay. in the there's okay, I just wanted to clarify that because I didn't want to leave that hanging there with some people thinking, oh, those are the guys over there that are going to cause the destruction of the human race, so we better get them. <laughs> but no, no, they're, it's they're all of us. Too, whether they realize it or not, because yeah. what's on the line for them is their life. Like, look, yeah. I mean, if you go out and you drink and you do coke or whatever, then you're not going to manifest your full potential. Like, it's just yeah. never going to happen. Right. And so you're losing and we're all losing because you're losing. 
right? And we're losing in the future even, like it's a big loss. And that's why we're in the fight. We're all in the fight. We're all in the fight together for sure. Mm -hmm. Whether we realize it or not, that's why I don't think character, that's why there is no culture war. It's not a war, right? And it's not about culture. It's about the human race and and ethics per se. If we it's lose. more it's it's more like the the twenty mile wide um, asteroid that's headed towards Earth, <laughs> and if we don't all pull together <laughs> to do something about it, it's going to closer to that. Hard. Yeah, right. It's closer to that. Right, right. Because they don't they don't see that different. Like they don't necessarily see that difference. The atheists, right? They don't. That, that's why they're casting it as a culture war. And later on in the conversation, they go into this. Maybe the right, and Jordan says this, right? He says, maybe the right thing to do is to not worry about an, an antidote, or, or, or I'm sorry, not an antidote. What does he use? Not an answer. An answer, right, thank you. Yeah, maybe we, we don't wanna want an answer, right? And John kind of agrees. Yeah, we don't want an answer. We want an antidote, which is not to engage. Right, still correct. Right, that's why when people go, oh no, that's a culture war issue. I'm like, oh, that's bad framing. The whole thing is bad framing. They agree on that later on, right? Mm -hmm. right, right, right around 145 or something crazy, way up there. Yeah, so they, they do agree. Like, this is, not, this is not just me. Like, a lot of people see this. I think Peugeot sees this too. Well, and, and I'm trying to say something that's, I, I'm not articulating it very well, but I'm trying to get at some very, fundamental slightly deeper issue here too is that if we do if some people I mean not not I'm not talking about you and me here but if some people do fall into the trap of seeing it as us versus them the kind of sacred space that John is trying to construct is not going to be sufficient to prevent us from slaughtering them or them from slaughtering us Oh, I don't, I don't agree that that's correct at all. You don't? So again, no, no, no. I, I mean, again, if you, think, if you think of this whole problem in terms of ethics, and we go with my definition of ethics being the ideal and the morality being the implementation, then what you can do is you can say, look, we're, we're in an ethical landscape. Like that's a real thing and not the moral landscape that, that some relativists use who may or may not be a little bit crazy. All right, but a real ethical landscape where there are consequences to what you do, right? Like, like mm -hmm. you know, if you take if you take uh, if you take Darwin seriously, like you can be on the wrong side of that equation, and that's no good. Uh, that means you're dead. So don't do that uh, because you're taking your your potential away from the rest of us. Like that's please don't do that, right? If you think of it in terms of not having the tools to navigate the ethical landscape then really it's all about giving people those tools. And then you could make a real good case for, yeah, well, that's why people hand out Bibles. Eh, maybe, I don't know. Like that's why people go and try to convert people. Maybe, <laughs> like maybe those people know something the rest of us didn't see, right? Or maybe not the rest of us, but some people didn't see. Uh, so, so, you know, I've always, I, 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 I always try to be kind to people who like, they'd shown up at the door, right? And they, they're preaching that wh whatever group, doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't happen all that often. Doesn't hasn't happened since I moved down south, weirdly enough. Uh, but up north, it happened quite a bit in New England. Um, you know, people would knock on the door, and and you know, usually I'd have them converted to my religion pretty quickly uh, because I'm way better at that than they are. <laughs> so, they, a couple of them had to come back with reinforcements. It wasn't that wasn't going to work either. I would have just had a larger cult at that point. But I uh, I. I, I decided not to keep playing that game because I was like, this isn't, gonna, this isn't gonna go anywhere. I'm just gonna have a bunch of followers. What am I gonna do? I'd have to be responsible. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's possible that dragging people into the tools of needed to navigate the ethical landscape is the only possible answer. And part of that is doing that through exemplification. Uh, but my great fear is that in order for people to get a sufficiently high signal that what they're doing is wrong, like with the French Revolution, the people who started the killing machine need to be killed by it, in essence, whether it's an actual killing machine or, a, or, a, or, or you know, cancel culture, or whatever, job killing machine, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you're killing. Uh, hopefully you're not killing people, though, that would be bad. Um, so maybe that's the only thing you can do. And I think that's the conclusion that John and Jordan come to later. Uh, around this, but you can see they're circling around the same three issues and Jordan's still trying to tie it together and John's still backing out of that religious framework the whole time. 
Well, for some reason, when you were talking, what popped into my head is part of the frame framing that Jordan does of evil in that tragedy versus evil, where he talks about evil is the like the personification of arrogance and resentment. And uh, and when I heard him say that, because I'm always mapping, <laughs> what came into my mind immediately was the other thing where he always talks about the best way forward is to live in gratitude and humility. So arrogance is the opposite of humility and resentment is the opposite of gratitude. So he's got, he's got a map in his head <clears throat> that arrogance and resentment are on the evil side and gratitude and humility are on the good side. <clears throat> yep. Um, yep. So I don't know why that came into my head, but I wanted to put it out there. Well, because because those are tools for orientation in the ethical landscape, right? You don't have to get to perfect, but you have to get to better. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you looking at? I mean, you can look at your ego, which would lead you to resentment, and right, and then that gets into this whole model that we're using on the server of closed world versus open world, mm -hmm. right? And this left, right, the four Ps, that whole, that whole thing. See our first conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I go into, I go into some of that there, but that maps neatly onto the ethical landscape and this concept of you have to move to better and you need a wide open world to do that because something has to shine through from somewhere. And if you're using discrete linear calculations to calculate the world, you're going to end up a socialist because if the world is a closed system where values cannot be created and cannot change, which is roughly what you're seeing unfold in the quote culture war, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, they're right. Uh, unfortunately, that isn't the way the world is. And so they're wrong. And, and that's sort of what the Christian ethos is all about is no, 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 there's potential everywhere. Miracles happen all the time. And if miracles happen, you're not in a closed world system, right? So that's, that's why people reject miracles. So they're preferring, they're preferring a negative intelligible world to an ambiguous potential world. A negative intelligible world. Yep, fully intelligible we'll say. Uh huh. To an ambiguous Good. potential world. Because people have anxiety over things they don't understand or Right. And so they're like, oh, I'd rather understand a bad thing that's going to kill me than to encounter the transcendent. Fair enough. <laughs> I understand that. Uh, but right. And, and that's because they prefer no struggle over struggle. But I'd rather struggle in towards the transcendent myself, which is personal choice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, other, otherwise it's uh, it's, uh, you know, alcohol and cocaine for me. So, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> Those are, the, those are roughly your options, yeah. Well, so that's where they jump into this whole thing about awe. And, mm -hmm. and they, um, John says that awe is your sense of self and egocentrism shrink. And they find a very, po people find that a very positive experience. And Jordan says, what we experience relative to our current ego when we hypothesize our ideal as well, awe is our unconscious ideal capturing us. Right. Um, he uses this figurative language that's just, it's just got Christianity written all over it, but, um, but yet not. So, um, very interesting. And John has to think about this carefully, right? I mean, he stops and sort of thinks about this very carefully. And Jordan well, part of the reason he stops and thinks about it is because the next thing that Jordan lays on him is this gigantic sentence, which I don't think I don't think he's really thought it through. I mean, may, I mean, he probably has thought it through, but it's it's not the way I think for sure. He says it's the spirit within. And he says to John, you already admitted, so to speak, that we are canonic representations of the central animating spirit of the ages. And that speaks from our unconscious because it is embodied within us and then it finds its grip on us in awe and admiration. It sounds like he's, I might be getting it wrong, but it sounds like he's saying that the God within mm -hmm. gets a grip on us. And, and that respond, then we respond in awe and admiration. Well, so interestingly, John's response to this is within and without. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure if Jordan's going 
uh, bottom up or top down here, right? I'm not sure. But John certainly thinks you need both, which is again, mm -hmm. interesting. But again, yeah, yeah, I think they're flip. little out thinkers to begin with. And that's why they keep rejecting the top down nature of what they're talking about, because the, the, what they're talking about has to come from without. It can't be coming from within. And what you're doing is you're matching your internal senses to the external golden thread, roughly speaking. And so John starts talking about there, you get too, religious people get too locked into the sacred as perfection. Yes. And then he starts, um, he and Jordan get into this debate, not debate, but I mean, Jordan says, is the sacred, the good becoming better? And John says, it's an inexhaustibleness. Right. Which I think Jordan agrees to, right? Well, and then Jordan goes on to say, well, when I've had visions of heaven, it's a place that is perfect and getting better. Right, right, right. And then they get into this whole thing about, um, about comparing visions. <laughs> and Jordan's kind of like, do you really want to go there, John? Do you really want to? And I was like, oh, I'm so with Jordan on that. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to go there. Definitely do not want to go there. Right. Right. And then, and then John actually gets frustrated and asks to be, you know, let me finish. And then, and then Jordan acquiesces and, and laughs at himself, basically saying, okay, before I move on to another universe, you mean, yeah. which I, I just thought that was great. Right. It was, <laughs> yeah. I know I'm all over the place. I know I'm going places, right. That maybe you can't follow because my visions, your visions. Right. So yeah, I thought that was very funny. So Jordan's really comfortable at this point, right? He's really comfortable with John, which I think is impressive. I think John is likewise comfortable with Jordan by this point. They're really settling into each other. But yeah, they're going back and forth. And John actually critiques Plato, which is great because John's a big admirer of Plato. Um, and, and then he goes into the concept of sacred and that, that uh, well that you go back to again and again. And it's always got water for you sort of a thing, uh, which is more of a concept he covers in his, in his uh, meditation series. But yeah, that's his idea of sacredness. It's an inexhaustible supply. I go out into the world, I change, I come back, I get the book right. We talked about this earlier. And and yeah, and 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 then uh, Jordan says, yeah, but what about the Bible, basically? And John says, well, yeah, yeah, sure, the Bible too, right? Why not, right? And then Jordan immediately jumps back to personality, right? And he starts talking about introverts and extroverts and how he divides them in the class and why that works. And John is like, wow, well, the whole cognitive field hasn't, hasn't thought about basically this whole idea of personalities um, or, or, or the personality types, we'll say, um, you know, because th they haven't thought about, uh, you know, they haven't thought about personality factors is what he calls them. And then he, he's like, you know, wow, that's pretty cool, right? Like, and then- Well, because they've been, they've been mapping the meta traits of efficiency and resiliency Exactly. And uh, stability exactly. and plasticity. He right. said they map onto each other. Right. And, I, and Jordan, I don't... but Jordan, Jordan here does something interesting, right? He says, yeah, the whole cognitive field hasn't done, hasn't done this because of its lack of recognition behind motivation and affect that are in personality. And he's very happy that John is doing it because John's working on a paper that talks mm -hmm. about this, right? Right. Well, so, but the, and the paper that Jordan was working on um, maps plasticity onto extroversion and openness intellect and maps stability onto neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And then it also talks about dopamine, serotonin, and plasticity mapping onto dopamine and stability mapping onto serotonin. Mm -hmm. So the dopamine is the exploration and incentive related action. So plasticity maps onto exploration and incentive related action. And serotonin is the satiety. Is that the right pronunciation or satiety? I used to always say satiety. No, I think it's satiety. Satiety. Um, satiety and constraint. So that's the stability the satiety and constraint, which I thought was really interesting that those things map that way. Yes. That's what that's what the paper talks, the paper that Jordan wrote that he wants to be sure that John knows. I wrote that paper back in 2009, long before you ever started working on this stuff. 
Right, right. Well, and then John's working with Colin DeYoung, a shared yes. student. So Colin's yes. probably read the paper and realized yeah. the connection. And so yeah. he's leading John down the path to some extent, which I find. Yeah, well, I mean, Colin was in on that paper with Jordan. So. Um, oh, OK. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. There, there you go. Because because John's yeah. working with Colin on the new paper, Big Five making use of relevance realization. So he's trying, trying to tie relevance realization back. So from there, they go into the whole machine learning and opponent processing and... Um, right, which is all related to our relevance realization is something that John got from Hinton's work with Wake Sleep and Jordan got from somebody else's work who worked with Hinton or something, or worked on Hinton's work or something like that. And then uh, Peterson ties it back uh, to evolution, right? And, so and I'm gonna share screen again here because right. I wanna I wanna share screen on this section. It's a good section, yeah. Yeah, and uh, let's see, it's at one thirty-five, I think. Yeah, we're way up there now. We're we're making progress, Mark. <laughs> it gets easier. They keep tying more stuff together. Yeah. Realize it because you can see the various traits as moving subpopulations to emphasize. This is a bad source of protein, and this is even worse because what people don't realize is that just eating stability, others to open ads. things up, and so what perso so personality is simultaneously helping to glue cognition together within the individual, but also glue distributed cognition together. Which goes back to your point about the role huh, of personality, right? Well, that would um, yeah. that would explain to some degree the existence of the niches of the, I mean, because imagine yeah. that there, there's niches, obviously, that these personalities yeah. fill because otherwise they wouldn't be useful. And exactly, exactly. the niches are valuable. Your claim in some sense is that the niches are valuable because they both expand and stabilize the exactly the, the map the, the analogy to biological selection is, 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 is intended in the work. And so I think that I mean, I started thinking about these niches of personality long, long, long time ago, just in terms of how many different things need to get done in the world. Right. And if there weren't a lot of different personalities, all these things that need to keep the world running wouldn't, you know, so it yeah. seemed to me that the fact that there are so many different personalities is a gift. Um, right. Well, it's required for something that's bigger than us. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and we need to appreciate that. And that's really the problem is we don't appreciate people who are different from us because we think that we're masters of the universe in and of ourselves. It's like, no, just because you can go down the street and get a hamburger, right? And, it, and it's very easy for us to cast a binary. We were actually talking about this this morning on the server in our, our after meditation chat on the, on the Discord server. And um, you know, I was, I was trying to point out, no, 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 no. There aren't two groups, vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, right? No one identifies as an anti-vaxxer, no one, right? And the people that don't take vaccines don't do so for different reasons. But all the people who take vaccines are taking it for the same reason. So they are a group. The fact that they cast everybody who's not them as a group does not make a group. Like that's not how that works. That's an us and them and that's their flaw. Not, it's not a reciprocal flaw. It's not like people on one side of the issue are doing the same thing people on the other side of the issue are doing. No, there's a huge asymmetry there. There's a complete imbalance. And, and it's like that in, in so many other things. I mean, as I pointed out, there's three buckets for voting and the largest one is neither left nor right. It's neither Republican nor Democrat. Most people are registered independents. What does that tell you? That tells you people self-identify as neither extreme. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. So I, there aren't two groups. That isn't what's going on. It's a bad map. It's a bad way to understand the world. But the more people talk like that, the, the fewer options people have because they get their attention gets hijacked and they start thinking in terms of, of binaries. And, and John's going into this here, right? He's basically saying, look, the personality is gluing all these things together and gluing together our, our distributed cognition. And it's like, yes, that's very important is to glue together the distributed cognition, which is what we need. You can't have distributed cognition. A, if, if everybody, everybody you're quote in a group with agrees with you, or B, you can't be in a group with people that you disagree with. I think you need both of those uh, qualities. You need to be able to be in groups that people you disagree with, because otherwise you're not doing distributed cognition. You're just doing outsourcing to something you think you already know. And that's just terrible for people, right? That's the othering. So let's let's listen for the next couple of minutes here too. Sure. You, you're picking up on it 
very yeah, it has different. to be if you're thinking well it has to be if you're thinking it's going to go anywhere right it, <laughs> i think so too i think so too yeah uh, well this is why i was interested in your reaction to the idea that you know we're selecting on the basis of logos because that's a well you know you I mean, you've been talking about the metaphysical status of consciousness and that's what drove me to to bring that issue up because the issue of god in some sense hinges on the issue of the metaphysical significance of consciousness that's what it that looks is, like I to think me that's right do you and think I, that's right I, I i i think it's right in that this way it depends i mean i don't want to do the simple party trick of what well, depends what you mean by god but what i'm trying what i'm saying is <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Very I, I funny. Think, I, I think there. I don't. Or think... real. It depends on what you mean by real. But when you ask questions like that, is God real? It depends on just as much on what you think is real as what you're asking about God. Exactly. So, and, and here's the here's the here's what I will say as a claim. I do not think we are going to solve, and I mean that in cognitive scientific terms, the problem of consciousness without addressing fundamental ontology. I've been arguing for that in yeah, that's that in my because that's where where. Um, the consciousness field studies has got it wrong. Consciousness isn't the fundamental mystery. Reality is the fundamentally mis exactly. fundamental mystery. And the secondary mystery is the relationship between consciousness and reality. Because it, is, it, is it a primary relationship? That's the fundamental ontological question. And one of the offshoots of that is, well, well how can you... Where is the reality without consciousness? Like, I haven't been... That's that objective world that's out there without us. But what is it that's out there without us? Without, forget us, consciousness. Well, and that. Yeah. I think that's enough to bite off for a minute here. <laughs> well, it's a lot, but you can see them tie those three threads together, like I was saying, right? It, he ties personality, right? There's always that golden thread thing, right? That they're talking about with motivation and affect tied into, look, when you're making these metaphysics, the minute you invoke metaphysics, you're in the God realm. Yes, I agree. Everybody who's talking about metaphysics is actually speaking religiously. Ha ha. <laughs> Joke's on you guys. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. You're all just, the minute you invoke metaphysics, you're talking about God. Every single time. You can't get out of that. You cannot get out of that. And John agrees. Like, John agrees with Jordan. Yes. The minute you invoke metaphysics, you're talking about God. You're in the religious realm. That's what you're doing. I, I don't see a way around that. That's why I never liked the I, the concept of meta. I'm like, what do you mean meta? You mean religion? Why do you have a new word for religion, guys? Come on, get with it. And then they never, people never see it. Well, so, but the interesting thing for me was when Jordan said, um, consciousness is not the fundamental mystery. People keep saying the hard problem of consciousness is so that's right. the fundamental hard problem including John. And, and some people have come along like Mark Soames and said, no, it's not the hard problem. We've solved it. We know where consciousness came from. So they've, okay. Yeah, I know they don't. <laughs> but, but he says, consciousness is not the fundamental mystery. Reality is the fundamental mystery. Right. Which right. kind of resonates with a lot of what I've been thinking. And the secondary mystery is the relationship between consciousness right. and reality. Yeah. Yes. So they use this word relationship a lot, which is a very religious word. Right. But that, but that, and I think I made this case before, right? Like that's the most important thing are the patterns because the patterns exist irrespective of the propositions. That's true all over the place. There's all these patterns that recur and it doesn't matter what systems they're in. Systems are groups of propositions, roughly speaking, or they can be thought of that way pretty easily. I mean, that's how we talk about them after all. Um, and, and with, but what that means is that what's more fundamental, the things or the patterns, the patterns are more fundamental. They have to be because they're everywhere, right? They're, they're irrespective of the objects uh, or whatever objects you wanna, you wanna postulate, even if they're not say real objects. And so, and, and that's, what, you know, that's what you're back to. And, but what the objective material realists are doing, right? Is they're saying, no, 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 there's an objective material reality. We're gonna stand there. Right, which again, I, I don't think there is. Uh, but even if there is, you can't stand there because there's no there there. Right, you need an objective third observer. You'd need God to get around that. Problem. There's no way around that problem. Right, but then they're standing there and they're doing this middle out trick, and they're saying, "All right, well, there's stuff coming at us from below, and there's stuff coming down to us from above." It's like, no, it's, you're never going to get there because you're assuming material objective reality. Right, instead of assuming 
you know, instead of realizing that, that, that that's the thing you're, you're roughly creating together, like that's the co-creation. So you can't stand there because you're in the process of co-creating it. Well, you're looking at, you're looking at uh, consciousness as bringing reality into being. Right. Yes. Are, are you disagreeing with me to accommodate me? Or are you actually, that's what you think? I mean, did no, I, that's, I, that, that's, that's correct. I think we went over this before actually true too, though. Yeah, I think that is correct. I don't think that's the whole answer, but that is, that is certainly correct. So are you like, um, Bernardo Castrop and analytical idealist? No, no, no. Okay. I think I, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I haven't read his work, but I, I but, I, I think I'm more on John's side about, you know, that's that's maybe an unverifiable claim to some extent. And therefore it may not matter. Like unverifiable claims don't matter. What's the unverifiable claim? That consciousness brings reality into being? Or that well, consciousness um, that is that fundamental? Simple. That it's that simple. So I don't believe that consciousness by itself brings reality into being. Oh, okay. 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 I'm glad we clarified that because that, yeah. that one, that's what I said. And you said, right. And I said, I'm well, not... <laughs> part of it's, it's not wrong. It, it's that's true. Consciousness does that. It's just that everything consciousness thinks does not come into being right. So it's not the only thing going on in other words, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, we, we can't, we can't go back to the atheists and say everything we think is real. Right. And you can look at it and you say, well, they're trying to build that world by putting us all in the computers, right? Literally as much as they can, mm -hmm. right? With VR, they're just gonna plug everybody into the matrix and then they control the matrix and then they control the world, right? They're just trying to play God at the, at the other level. But it's basically all that they're trying to do. That's very much where our society is moving. But that's not true. Like it doesn't even, well, first of all, software is a mess in general, but uh, so many bugs, so many bugs. But, um, but it's also not true. Like you can't get away with that because you can't, people can't live that way. Like they need to interact with the world and bump up against things. And, you know, and Jordan talks at one point about, you know, oh, introverts need to go outside to renew, right? And I'm like, yeah, 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 they do, Jordan, you're right. <laughs> yes, they do. As an introvert, I can safely say I need to go. I mean, I'm surrounded by 12 acres of land for a reason with a pond. Like I, I, I see birds and hummingbirds come to the window, right? Like I do this on purpose. Uh, this is very deliberate, believe me. Mm -hmm. I really need to be in the middle of the woods to refresh because I have way too much technology around me and way too many people around me most of the time, which is which is any people ever, by the way, because I'm a very good introvert. I'm like excellent at being an introvert. So <laughs> we, we don't just- power. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's one of my many superpowers. Thank you very much. What, one superpower? Come on, Karen. <laughs> so yeah, but but I think that's it. Like, it's not one thing. It's not like you can't just say, oh, look, when we solve consciousness, which we're nowhere near doing, uh, when we solve consciousness, we'll know how to manifest the reality the way we want. Now, I don't think it's that simple either. Like, I think there are emanations and then you consciousness has to move towards one of them. That would be a golden thread maybe, right? And then if you're too far away from those emanations, whatever you try to manifest is gonna fail, right? And then that's the evolutionary process at a higher level in essence. Mm. So when, when Jordan says, what is out there without us? Right. Or forget us. What is out there without consciousness? Right. Right. Right, right. Right, because because again, this gets into the if there's not no one there to perceive it, does it exist thing? Yeah, exactly. So then John makes this move, which I thought was kind of weird. He jumps right into, oh, you know, there's this exciting thing out there, speculative realism and object oriented ontology, and yes, and uh, OO programming, which is a great disaster of computer science, by the way. I'll just note real quick. Well, and I did a little research on speculative realism and object-oriented ontology via Wikipedia. Thank you very much. And uh, and the biggest criticism there is that this is a uh, this is kind of like virtual philosophizing via the internet, and it's it's being looked down upon by real philosophers who are sitting in their ivory towers. So I don't know whether there's anything to it or not. I read several of the kind of summaries of various speculative realists and they disagree with each other quite astronomically on a variety of issues. So how they're all in the same camp, I have no idea. But roughly speaking, there's somewhere over in that woods with process philosophy. 
and and the whitehead type people and then there's this other guy named Deleuze who he has some interesting ideas but I mean it's basically like a lot of philosophy how many angels can dance on the head of a pin well that that that, that you see that that causes all kinds of conflicts in my head because I think if you know the philosophers on high hate it I'm like oh that sounds good to me no. <laughs> well, I'm out of response right I'm contrary. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, object-oriented programming was a disaster in the software. Uh, OK, so what was object-oriented programming? So object-oriented programming, yeah, there's a long history. If you want to talk computer history, we can go for literally days, uh, or at least I can. Uh, so I think we've got, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'll, I'll try to wrap it up quickly. So basically, there's this concept of, of um, of uh, UML, which is this design philosophy, where you can just design a business process on a board and then take that flowchart, roughly speaking, and translate it into a, into a computer, right into a computer design, like pretty much directly. And that was from the 70s into the early 80s. I think maybe I have my numbers, my, my timelines wrong, but roughly that was the first. So what happened was somebody noticed, oh, well, we could just build objects and give them properties Right. And then what you would be doing in programming is instead of calling loops and variables and all that, you'd set up things called classes. And those classes would define these objects and all the properties of the objects. And then you would just call into that. And then that would map, you know, that's closer for the programmer to what's on the board as a as a flow chart. And when we could put in memory management and all this fancy, you know, fancy computer stuff. And what happened was all the exceptions killed them. Right. And so then they had to say, well, we can overload an object. So if we need an object in this special condition that also has one feature or, or maybe, you know, maybe this one property gets reversed in this one instance, then you override it over here. Right. But what happens is you get combinatorial explosion. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. So every time you try to pen the system in too much with computer language, what happens is the exceptions kill you. They absolutely murder your system. It's like the ultimate intersectionalism in the computer. Right. So all of this already happened. I was there. I watched it all happen in the computer industry. It's hysterical to watch because I'm like, yeah, this project's going to fail because, you know, and, and, and which is not to say you can't make a good OO design. You absolutely can. It just takes a huge amount of architecture work and it takes a really good software architect to do it and somebody who can not only understand the programming, but understand the business side. And it's always this fight between the business people. The business people never know what they do. So just getting them to define what they do is like a huge struggle in computers. But then you need, still need to take that and translate it so that the engineers know how to code it. Because even if the, you know, it's all about the data and where it sits and how it's stored and then how you're accessing it. And if you go by screens, which is what OO tends to do, you actually get bad answers because you end up grabbing the same data over and over again. Because you, you, when you look at it from the bottom up, you go, oh, the shortcut is to just take the whole data set. It's like, yeah, but now you've got you know, gigs of data you're not using that you don't need for the screen because you stored it wrong, right? And so it gets into this whole thing. And, and so you take these really simple tasks and you turn them into these huge programs that don't work. They're too slow, they crash. Right. And there's all these technology problems along the way, Java and virtual machines and everything. It, it just gets crazy. And the combinatorial explosion usually kills those projects uh, pr pretty swiftly. There's a long history you can look up on the Internet of the failures of object oriented programming in the in the industry. It's, it's pretty much frowned upon now by, by most of the people in the know, basically. And they've moved on to other uh, worse ideas, basically, is what they're, what they're mostly doing. Well, my guess is that they've taken that terminology into philosophy and they're using it in an idiosyncratic way that has nothing whatever to do with the programming method. Uh, I, I bet they're using it in exactly the same way because it, it's, it's a natural outgrowth of scientific thinking that you can divide things into these neat categories and that they'll always fit the categories and that those categories are relevant to the real world. And it's like, yeah, that's, you know, that's not how that works. And it can, it can work for human business processes. It can. It's, but it's unbelievably hard to do. Like you need a really good software architect and, and I've done it. Like I, it can be done, absolutely. It's just really hard to do. And most, like 99.999% of software architects can't do anything like that. They just do not have the knowledge and skill and understanding to do it. And you can't learn it from books. You actually have to learn it from being in the middle of a business process. In fact, you're better off being in a business process and trying to put it on paper than you are to, to start from the from the computer science side right 
So if you start from the process side, what are you actually doing as a human? Then you can come up with OO designs much better than anybody who's trained in CS, much better. Computer science people can't do it well at all because they're coming at it as though these things are already existing and they're not, they emerge from the process and you have to figure out where they emerge and then figure out where those objects are. Well, that fits right into, let me just share screen one more time and we'll give these guys the last word sort of. Sure. Um, I think it's here. And take it over to 138, right about there. See what John has to say. So yes, things have to be able to influence and disclose each other in a way that is dark to us. And then what it's does like that dark mean? matter, dark matter on the on the on, on the metaphysical, the metaphysical plane. End. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and what does that mean? Well, what it's interesting. You know, it, it means it means to some degree that you can pick up the orbit of the Earth using Foucault's pendulum. Yeah, it means that. You know it, what I mean? It read what I mean. It means that because somehow the all is embedded in the exactly, in the in the exactly. in the in the in the yep. singular. I, I got what and you, you see that with Foucault's pendulum. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I, I was I was playing between. I, I was just there was two references in my mind. There was the there was, there was the the historical thing, and, and then there was the book, yes. right? And I said, yes. oh, okay, <laughs> right. I love that when Jordan did that. <laughs> you can pick up the orbit of the Earth from Foucault's pendulum, right? Because it means that the all is embedded in the singular. I mean, that's right. the that's the whole gig right there. It all scales. Um, yeah, it's scale invariant, as Taleb would say. Yeah. Yeah. This has been really good, Mark. We made it through 40 minutes. Amazing. I, I told you it would get quicker and easier. And I think it's yeah. that continues. So yeah, it's it's been wonderful. Always, always lovely to do this with you. I really appreciate your insights. Okay. Well, let me know when we can do it again next time and I'll be with you. Absolutely. Thanks, okay. Karen. Bye-bye.